Hi friends, Max Elash here. On this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, we have adaptive CrossFit Games athlete and four-time Wadapalooza champ, Casey Acre. We talk about his athletic career, his mindset, how he approaches training, and I think that's everything. Listen up, you'll enjoy it. Before we get into it, make sure you hit that subscribe button because we're on our road to 35K subscribers. And when we hit that milestone, we're gonna give away a Black Zinc Rogue 2.0 barbell. Leave a comment below telling us what your favorite part of this podcast was. That comment is what's going to enter you into the giveaway. Once we reach that 35,000 subscriber milestone, we'll use a random YouTube comment generator on one of these videos where we promoted the giveaway to draw a worldwide winner for that bar. So all you gotta do is be subscribed and comment below to enter. Train along some of the best athletes in the world at the sport of CrossFit. To get a free sample week of our current training cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. I wanna hear your story. So, you, I mean, I really just came into contact with you, got your email. Mm -hmm. We had discussed just adaptive training in the sport of CrossFit. You came down, met the coaches. I've watched you train for the last couple of days. I'm super impressed. And I, I asked you about your Instagram channel before we got on because I wanted you to share it so that people could, prior to us having a conversation, could just see some of the stuff that you figured out yeah. how to do in CrossFit that I found. Like you were training with the onsite group and you're snatching. What? How much were you snatching in that session? Uh, I got up to 230. Yeah. So you hit 230. And I mean, that was by far the most impressive thing that I think maybe. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Happened. Pause, pause, pause. Should we make it clear? Should okay, it's people are, uh, the video people can clearly see that you don't have a hand? Yeah, uh, but the audio people have no idea yet. Right. Yeah. So right. maybe let them know before yeah, you yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So give us give us that. Like, what's the okay. what's the condition and all yeah. that stuff? Yeah. So I um, don't have any like diagnosed name for what what caused it, but just a congenital amputee. So just while I was in the womb, just the arm stopped developing doctors knew before I was born that it just didn't finish growing. So, um, it was, it was something that my parents kind of had some time to prepare for. And, um, yeah, so I've just, I've lived my whole life with just a little bit of my forearm. Um, nothing after the, the first couple inches of my forearm on my, on my left arm. Yeah. Okay. So you can go to his Instagram channel. And so you have the elbow joint is still there, right? Yes, yes. So you have the elbow joint mm -hmm. and you hook a strap onto the barbell, yeah. you hold onto the strap mm -hmm. and um, most people listening probably can't snatch 230 pounds yeah. and you hook the strap on, you snatch it overhead and then you balance it on the remaining part of your arm. Yeah. So the bar is kind of tilted just given that you have one arm that's fully extended. Right. You stabilize it overhead that way. I saw you doing rope climbs this morning, mm -hmm. bar muscle ups, mm -hmm. handstand push ups. Like you literally have figured out how to do all of the skills of CrossFit, yeah. which is super impressive. And also just, I think, a testament to the amount of work that you put in developing those skills with you know, two full arms, two full legs is a huge task for people. So a testament to just your athletic capability in general. Mm -hmm. So prior to discussion, I feel like people should just go and just see some of that stuff. Yeah. Cause it, I know like we had talked about you coming down and doing adaptive, we've had an adaptive athlete training in the environment, but I think seeing the level of proficiency that you got was still like awe inspiring. Mm -hmm. It was like, holy shit, this is a, this is a whole nother level of what you can really push to from an athletic just impressed with like yeah. the MacGyver nature of like, <laughs> yeah, fuck it. Yeah. I'm going to figure this shit out. Yeah. Like, like yeah. Just no excuses type mm -hmm. mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Should so, we, all, should we also say that what was the stat that if you had done the open or you were giving us a stat that, or Mike did that you would have beat <laughs> everybody in the regular division? I, uh, I, yeah, I just, I did both the adaptive open and the RX open and, and qualified for quarterfinals. Um, I finished like 1200th in, in North America in the quarterfinals. So that's really impressive. What type of modifications? So for people that did it, like for each one of the events, when you did the normal, did you make any modifications? Um, so the only one that, well, I guess actually two probably. So the, um, the wall walk workout, yeah. I just stacked plates up on my left side. So I had like a row of four, four forty five or, uh, eight forty five stacked to, uh, two on top of each other so that it, I was like an even in that so plank you push position, off your hand and then walking push. back. Oh, yep. Cool. So okay. it was kind of awkward was with that tape line where my hand is, isn't where my elbow would naturally be. So I had to actually kind of do like a like <laughs> gymnastics type press up yeah. to get, to get started. 
walked all the way back, made sure my arm got in the tape line and then walked back out. Um, and then other than that, the, the dumbbell snatch workout, um, I just didn't alternate hands, obviously. So I just did yeah. all 150 reps oh. on my right hand, yeah. which no, the, the adaptive version of that workout was exactly the same, same weight, yeah. same reps, except for we had to do hand release dumbbell snatches at the bottom. So I did, mm. I did that workout twice that weekend. The first time I did it, I had to hand release oh my, my dumbbell God. at the bottom. So it was like my back was blown up because you're just spending like way more time yeah. down in that hinge position. Yeah. And then I did it again a couple of days later and just went ahead and said, well, I'm not going to alternate hands. I'm just going to go touch and go. Um, and like when you watch me doing a dumbbell snatch next to someone who's proficient at the hand to hand switch, yeah. the speed of repetition is like about the same. So mm. I submitted the video. I said, if they feel that I need to get penalized for not switching <laughs> hands, that's fine. But really what yeah. becomes a limitation on that for me is grip endurance yeah. more than you really just hanging anything. on for the the same yeah. hand the whole time. Yeah. 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 Man. Okay. And those are the only adjustments you made. Yeah. And I mean, I do, I do double unders with a mono rope. Yeah. So it's I, a single handle. It's a in single front. handle in front. That's basically attached to like a rod yeah. where the, the handle swivels on each side of the rod. Um, yeah. I mean, other than that, I, I did the, the thrusters and, uh, all the gymnastics pull up bar movements, um, clean complex, all that was, yeah. was pretty much the same. Yeah. So and the final thing before we get going, you also beat Tiger Woods in a round of golf. <laughs> <laughs> nah. No. Oh, come on, man. No. You did. Uh, no. We would be, I would have been like, hold on, wait. I didn't hear that. Uh, uh, no. Yeah, no. Unfortunately, uh, golf is a little too boring for me to have to spend that much time to even become proficient. Too at, slow. So, too slow. Yeah, yeah. yeah too slow. I feel slow. like most good CrossFitters, most good CrossFitters, it's like that they need the speed and yeah. intensity. Yeah. Whereas they're like, okay, I got to wait five minutes before mm -hmm. I hit the ball next. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just yeah. too much mental boredom. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I appreciate it. And I, I, I respect people who are good at golf because it's just a sport of patience, I guess, yeah. you know, and skill. Yeah. Oh yeah. 100%. But you've cheated on your significant other more than tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Something, come on, man. Something. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, yeah. You'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to use, I kind of want to, I want to hear your story kind of from start to finish. Cause I'd like to understand the mind state of what it's like to grow up just differently, you know, and yeah. like how you cope with that, mm -hmm. what, what that led to in terms of athletic development. Cause I think the ingenuity that you have with regards to the development of your athletic self is super impressive. And I'm assuming that didn't start just with CrossFit kind of started right. with how you think about life, how you dealt with adversity. And I feel like a lot of times, a lot of the most interesting and achieving people do come from adverse situations. Yeah. It's not like things were perfect. So I kind of want to hear how you process it, how you look at, you know, your situation versus what, whatever 95% of humanity is dealing with in mm -hmm. terms of having four limbs and kind of how you process that whole situation, what your parents, like how they help, help you cope with that situation. So yeah. I'm not sure where you'd want to start with that question. Maybe just in terms of like, I don't know when you even become aware of like, Oh, I'm, I'm different. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. when that, what that process is like and how it was communicated to you and what that led to as a child, maybe like five years old or something. Sure. Yeah. Or? yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, um, well, it's whatever you remember at that yeah, stage. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think that I became pretty aware of it fairly young. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I had an older brother and so I had like a model of what was like normal, yeah. I guess you'd say. Yeah. Um, and so kind of talking about my parents, I think that that's definitely been like a huge, part and a huge factor in why I've been able to kind of just attack life and, and go and try to, you know, challenge myself and achieve the things that I've wanted to achieve, um, without, you know, kind of letting my disability hold me back. Yeah. Um, my parents basically just treated me the same as they did my other two siblings. Yeah. Um, I never really felt like I had any excuse or reason to, um, not, not, you know, do everything that everyone else was doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that goes back to just like learning how to tie shoes or learning how to button a button on yeah. a pair of pants or, you know, whatever of just like from a young age, I had to just start figuring out how to do things the way that I was going to do them. Yeah. Cause it wasn't going to look the same as other kids or, or my older brother or what my mom and dad did. Um, so my parents were, were very supportive and were very helpful and, and kind of helping me to develop those things and, and learn, you know, how I was going to 
you know, essentially just exist and, and go through life like normal. Yeah. Um, but then also on the flip side of that, they were, you know, never going to, you know, let me coddle use my you. arm as yeah. an excuse or coddle me yeah. or, or, you know, anything like that. Um, so, you know, early childhood became fairly aware that I was different from other kids in the neighborhood and, and kids at school pretty early. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I just had that, that foundation of not really feeling that different, even yeah. though I was. Um, so then like, you know, getting older and, and I, I really started to get involved with sports at a pretty young age. My older brother was a phenomenal athlete, went on and played college football and all that. So he was always who I was like trying to strive to be like, and kind of chase. And I just, I wanted to do the things that, that he was doing. Um, and so that definitely brought on some new challenges and again, just kind of like figure out how I was going to approach something. Yeah. So the way that I'm going to shoot a basketball is going to be a little bit different, but I knew that if I just kept working at it, I could get it close to this, you know, the same as the other kids yeah, or the way that figure. I'm catching footballs or whatever, is just going to be a little bit different, but I can pretty much figure, figure anything out. That's, yeah. that's just my, you know, it's just my way of, of doing it and then take that and work on it and try to optimize that. Yeah. I want to hear about some of the things that you've learned and how you figured them out. Cause I'm, sh I'm sure figuring them out early leads to now you figuring out skills in your own way pretty well. Yeah. But I also want to talk about the mindset. So this might be like kind of silly, but I know when I was going through puberty, I got like really chubby and got made fun of as a kid. And then I felt a lot of like shame and frustration about that level of differentness to mm -hmm. like whatever was standard or whatever was cool or whatever was popular. Did you ever have any of that? Like almost like frustration in the process? Like, you know, pity, why, why is this the case? Or oh, yeah. was it, okay, you did go through that yeah. type of process. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I can remember times, um, just getting so frustrated with, uh, I don't know, like learning how to tie my shoes. And I was, I was in like the first or second grade and like all the other kids could tie their shoes. And yeah. I guess when you're seven, that's like a pretty important thing <laughs> yeah. because I just remember being like so frustrated that everyone else could do it. And I, you know, I, I would have those thoughts like, why does this have to be me? why do I have to deal with this? And, yeah. and, you know, um, is it, is it my fault or, you know, you kind of almost start wondering who's to blame here. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I think that again, with the support of my parents and with the support of my older brother, just, you know, telling me that it, it was okay. And like, I was going to be able to figure things out and then helping me work through those things and, and eventually, um, you know, kind of being able to achieve them. Um, I think from an early age, I started to actually kind of value those challenges. And I, I realized that, um, you know, I, I loved that rewarding feeling of being able to figure something out. Yeah. So I think that that kind of led to a, a foundation and a framework of like enjoying pushing into challenges rather than trying to avoid them. Yeah. Um, because the payoff at the end of it was, you know, it was, it was, very rewarding to me. And I, I enjoyed how I felt at the end. So then over time, um, even at a pretty early age, I can remember just like thinking, okay, I don't want to just be good at something relative to having one hand. I just want to be good at something. Yeah. Um, and I think definitely having like a very, very competitive mindset probably helped with that. Yeah. Um, almost competitive to a fault, uh, whenever I, you know, when I started yeah. getting involved with sports and things like that, like just wanting to win so bad that I was willing to do pretty much anything to try to do it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of a negative, but I think that that was definitely a big, um, a big reason that I was able to take those challenges and just continue pushing and, you know, just trying to be, like I said, not just the best, one-handed basketball player. Like I just wanted yeah. to be the best basketball player in the school and on the, on the court and against other opponents. So, um, I, I pretty early never really thought about just comparing myself to someone that's disabled, but rather everyone yeah, you know, setting, just, just yeah, trying the to just, what's the humanity. gold? Yeah. What's yeah. the gold standard? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so is that mindset, is it different in the adaptive community of people that have accidents where it's not from birth? Cause I would imagine you got to kind of go through that same process of like recultivating a mindset of acceptance of like, this is who I am. This is my life situation. This is who I want to become. This is what I got to do to become the person I want to become in the future, which I would imagine is a little bit harder to reconcile if it happens when you're 25 or 30 or something like that. Cause yeah. you had this whole identity 
that was cultivated in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then it's all of a sudden like, okay, well now you're different after this one moment, whatever it is like disease or injury or whatever actually happens. Mm -hmm. Is there talk about this, that in the adaptive community? I'm not that like yeah. plugged into it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think like everything is, is case by case and it's, it's very individualistic and um, you know, maybe for, for some people, it really depends on what type of support system you have or, you know, what your background was like. Um, but there are definitely people who spend years after an accident or something like fully, just totally depressed and just yeah. not able to get themselves to go try to attack the things that they want to be doing with their lives because they, they may have this, this feeling of, you know, they're, they're, they, they're feeling sorry for themselves or, um, you know, they have kind of that why me mentality. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, those cases aren't very common in the community that I'm in because a lot of the adaptives that I'm around are people who have, um, they're striving. They're, they're striving. Yeah. yeah. They're, they've taken those instances and they've, they've gone and, and been okay with being challenged and relearning how to live. Yeah. Um, but even, even some of those did spend the, that first couple of years, um, in just some dark times. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Sure. And, and I, I totally get it and I understand it. And I, I say all the time in, in my community, I'm one of the lucky ones, mm. you know, because I've had my whole life to deal with this and I've learned everything that I've learned. I've learned how to do with one hand. Yeah. Um, whereas some of the people who I compete against or alongside, they lived half their life with two hands or with two legs. And then they had something happen to them and then they had to totally relearn. So, yeah. um, I think the, the one big thing though, is that our community can serve, um, as a visual of like, what can you do if you, um, push through that adversity and, and the things that, that some people can achieve, um, with fitness kind of being the, the, the medium for a lot of people to then go on and do really big and important things with their life and empower other people to, um, you know, push into their challenges and, and go and try to achieve the things that they want to, that they want to try to achieve. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be, I'm sure just totally life altering. You can have someone who is maybe a, a extremely positive person and then they have something happen to them. And, and yeah. I, I, I can imagine that that situation is, is daunting yeah. in, in some cases. So, yeah. So we talked a little bit about this. People reached out in the past for like adaptive coaching. And mm-hmm. I, I was, I was hesitant because I don't really feel like an expert in, in training adaptive athletes. If I have no experience, I never really yeah. thought about, well, it's just training. Like I was watching what you were doing and I'm like watching through the principles of how you solve things. And little example, we did a workout on site. It was double dump, double kettlebell snatches, front squats, lunges, and power cleans. And you did it with a heavier single kettlebell. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards you're over there, you sneakily went over and started doing uh, kettlebells, uh, deadlifts on the other side. Mm-hmm. And I was like, huh, he's thinking about like how to maintain structural balance as he's doing this sport. That's it's symmetrical in nature. If Mm -hmm. you have, you know, if you're doing double kettlebells, but you're doing all these reps on one side, right? if you just keep adding to that pattern over time, you probably become twisted and asymmetrical. So it's like, oh, it's the same principle. You just got to figure out what are the patterns and you've kind of figured your N equals one out. Yeah. As now, if I like, let's say, okay, well now I'm kind of interested in this, like as a, almost like think of it as a, as a way to connect to people that could inspire me and teach me new things about training. I don't have empathy to not having a limb or being super different, Mm -hmm. but it seems like as you're talking, the mindset that you're trying to cultivate is like, who gives a shit, get it done. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. You want to do this, get it done. Yeah. But I think in the past, I would have felt almost like. I'm being too insensitive or like, I'm not, um, appreciating how difficult it is to try to overcome that. What would you say as somebody who's like, not, I'm not part of the adaptive community. If I were to get into coaching that, like, how do you, how do you handle? Cause you're also a coach mm-hmm. who coaches adaptive athletes. How do yeah. you handle that kind of tough love type of situation to cultivate that mindset? Cause yeah. eventually like you're an athlete, Travis and Noah are athletes, whatever, like the things you deal with are the same. Yeah. They're different, but they're also the same. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately you have to help people callous their mind to the adversity and see the challenge as something exciting and push beyond their limits. And your limits are going to be different than their limits, mm-hmm. but it's kind of the same type of process now as I'm 
thinking about it and observing it and watching what you've been able to do as an athlete. Yeah. Um, how do you handle that as a coach or how, what type of advice would you give me in that type of situation? Well, I mean, so obviously kind of like you said, it, it may be a little bit easier for me because I am dealing with a little bit more specifically some of the same challenges that, you know, the yeah. adaptive athletes that I'm coaching are going through. So I can kind of say like, yeah, look, I know that's <laughs> tough, but, but look, <laughs> look, yeah. And I don't, I don't mean to like showboat myself yeah. or anything like that. Like, I don't want to take that approach by any means, but, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just, I, I think that a lot of people probably have a lot more to give than what they're willing to put out at times. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't, I never want to let someone, whether it's an adaptive athlete or someone that's fully able-bodied, um, everyone has something, yeah. you know, everyone has some adversity. So every, everyone has stressors and, and things that are going on. Um, but the keeping in mind, you know, what's the, what's the end goal here? And if you can push through this and learn from whatever your challenges are that you're going through to then achieve whatever that goal is, or, or maybe you don't even achieve that goal, but just the process of, of trying to push through things is, is going to be um, rewarding. It's going to allow for you to grow. It's going to, um, you know, potentially a, a kind of bulletproof you to later adversities or ch that's challenges. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's universal. That's, that's not just for adaptive athletes. Um, you know, we, as the adaptive community just have a little bit easier time seeing and, and showing and, and, um, you know, being a visual for, yeah for those challenges. Yeah. The but, adversity is on display. Yeah, you can't exactly. see like it, if somebody's in pain or has emotional stuff at exactly. home or yes, but yes. yours is there. But it's all, to, to me, it's, it's kind of all the same. So, um, and, and people are, are pushing through that adversity and, and achieving what their, what their goals are all the time. So, um, you know, to me, I, I have benefited, I've only benefited by my limitation because I think that, um, I've cultivated some, um, personality traits that are maybe at a result of being born with one hand. So yeah. to me, like I, I hear a lot of people and I've, I've had, you know, I played high school basketball and football and things like that. And people would say, man, you're, you're a really good athlete for having one hand. Imagine if you had two hands and I'm like, okay, I, yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. Like, I understand like, I probably could have caught footballs a little bit better if I had two hands, yeah. but I'll play devil's advocate and I'll say, I'll say, you may be right, but one of my greatest strengths has never been my skills or my actual sport related um, characteristics. It's been my work ethic and it's been my hustle. Yeah. And I think that those were a result of knowing that that was something that I could control and that if that I could be better than other people because of those things. Yeah. I was never going to grow a second hand. And, and as much as many times as I tried to dribble a basketball with my left arm, oh, I thought you were about was, to say as many times as I tried to grow. A <laughs> <laughs> as many, uh, yeah, as many like nuclear power plants as I tried to break into Stick to in see your... if I could get some sort yeah. of mutation to grow too, my hand. Too back. many X-Men movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, like, um, you know, I, I was never going to, to, have the same, um, upper end skill, uh, potential as some of the people that I was competing against that had two hands, yeah. but I could work harder than them and I could hustle more than them. Um, and I could, I could totally, um, leave everything on the floor. Um, and so those to me became my best sport qualities. Um, and, and I think that they were the result of having that mindset that, it was okay that I was going to be a little limited in one area. This is another area yeah. where I can kind of compensate for. Yeah. There's a, a lot of research or empirical stories. And I think there's even stuff in just like uh literate body in the body of literature over time, just in terms of stories that people that have early success or who have a lot of talent are oftentimes inhibited by that. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost like a, it's a gift that becomes a curse because mm -hmm. you don't have to work yeah. and working is the thing that creates virtuosity over time. Yeah. Like whether you're talented or not talented, if you want to be great at something, you have to work. Mm -hmm. And if you're really talented, you can work less. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're not, or if you have, you know, you you have one arm trying to play a skill sport with a ball where you got to use your hands to move it around, yeah. you have to work. Yeah. So you had to have cultivated such a great 
it, to me, watching it, it's not just a work ethic. I feel like it's a problem solving mentality yeah. that you kind of created. I want, I want to hear about basketball and football. I want to hear how you did that, how you practice, how much time you put in, what your role was on the team. Like, I'm just okay. so curious how you, um, became so adept at learning skills physically. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, uh, it, it definitely starts with childhood and, and like I said, having an older brother who was a, a really great athlete yeah. and, and also having that just natural competitive mindset. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it definitely started like in the neighborhood with the, the kids I grew up around just and play, just like, play. Yeah. yeah. Just play. Yeah. Um, it's a solution. A lot of times it is, you know, we try to yeah. think about it, but sometimes yeah. like just have fun and play a 100%. And yeah. I learned so much in, in, the non-organized side of, of sports. Yeah. Um, and it was probably because this, the same way that my brother approached, you know, playing against me of like, not, not going any easier on me just because I was younger or only had one hand, yeah. everyone else in the neighborhood kind of, you know, had that same, that same mentality. I, my, um, I had a cousin, really one of my best friends who grew up down the road for me, also a really good athlete and, and, um, you know, strong and athletic and good at sports. And so we just had a big group of kids in our neighborhood that we just played all the time. Um, and I wanted to win. And yeah. so I was trying to, fi I just started figuring things out. Um, and then that, that definitely carried over into organized sports. Um, first sport I started playing was basketball. Um, and I've, I've talked about this on some, on some other podcasts. So a thing that's almost been, um, I don't know, an, an important formative, uh, stage was when I was in fourth grade, um, the fifth grade team was the only team that got to play games. So there were fourth graders and fifth graders. The fifth graders were the only ones that got to play games. The class that was ahead of me didn't have enough kids to have like a full team. So they told us at the beginning of the year that three of the fourth graders were going to get to play up with the fifth grade team and play in the, in the games that they got to play. I think at the time they only played like five games in their season, like <laughs> practice every single night from November through February and you play games. five games. But like, I wanted to play in those games so bad. Yeah. And I was not one of those three fourth graders that were chosen to, to play on that fifth grade team. That prepped you for CrossFit. And uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> play, play a couple games, practice all year. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Cause that's yeah, train that, all training is the, the sport. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that was like, that just like lit a fire in me and yeah. I, I was angry and I thought the, the, I know for a short time frame there was maybe this idea of like, okay, well, if I'm not good enough, then I should just quit. But I, I just like never yeah. let that really, um, sink in or whatever. And so then I just started pushing and I was, I was all winter long. I was in my driveway. It was dark outside. We had the street light on trying to work on dribbling and, and yeah. shooting and passing. And so dribbling, for example, yeah, you got your right arm. Yeah. If you cross over, you pull your right hand to the other side and like push it back yeah. or you hit it back with the other arm at or? times, at times it's, it's kind of more of just like an in out move yeah. there. I, I did eventually get to where I could like cross over to my left arm and then bring it back across my right arm. Um, I definitely, I think I almost kind of developed some, some dribbling, some handles that were unique. Yeah. So I like had it all a, might almost be kind of hard to, because if somebody had to stand to one side to yeah. guard you, then it opens up yeah. passing and lane. Exactly. Like I'm imagining exactly. that you could almost, there's a guy in the NCA wrestling. I don't remember when it was a couple of years ago, he had one leg and yeah. he won nationals yes. and yes. it became like, well, you take off one leg, mm -hmm. his upper body was probably twice as strong yeah. as most 125 yeah. year old guys. Cause he's like a 190 year old pound guy mm -hmm. without a leg. Yeah. yeah. So I'm and imagining you could almost turn it into a strength because people haven't seen the patterns before. Exactly. They don't that's, know how to defend. That's what I was going to say is that he started developing movements. Hold on, are we and, still and, talking and about fourth and fifth grade? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> they yeah. hadn't seen shit. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. he, he started developing things <laughs> that were different than what his competitors had ever seen. So yeah. it was like almost a little bit of an advantage. And I think yeah. kind of same thing for me, you know, I would, I had a behind the back move where I would be dribbling hard to one side to my right side. And then would become, I'd come behind the back. And before the defender had a chance to adjust to it, I was already past them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. even though then I was having to kind of catch up to the ball with my right hand, where generally you wouldn't want to dribble on the same side that the defenders on. Yeah. I was kind of like already past. Hit uh, him with the white uh, chocolate. Uh, yeah. Just like, again, <laughs> yeah. just kind of figure yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm white chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, just kind of figure out things that were going to work for me. Yeah. Um, and then like football that, that uh, our family is a big football family. Um, 
in youth, I was, I played more of like a running back. So it was pretty natural, just like taking handoffs and stuff like that. It was never really too yeah. big of an issue. Um, when I got into high school, I was a little bit undersized to be able to play running back. How I was, much do you weigh right now? Right now I weigh around 193. Um, okay. a, a deceptive 193. Yeah. Um, I mean, but, h- how much mass would you guess would you lose or gain by having? I don't know. I yeah. wish I've, we could like weigh your other arm it, and just it, get a gauge. I've thought about that. I don't know because I think that there's definitely some mass in like my shoulder and pec and lat that also probably would have been able to develop a little bit more. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, kind of again being the devil's advocate, I I've spent my whole life just squatting. So my legs True. and hips are, yeah. are pretty big and developed. So maybe the trade-off would have been, I wouldn't have been spending as much time on my lower body knowing that I was going to need to optimize. <laughs> yeah, I would have been benching and doing curls, <laughs> yeah. obviously. Um, so yeah, I was pretty small in high school. I was like 130, 135. Really? Yeah, very, oh, wow. very All small. The, like as a senior? Um, by the time I was a senior, I probably was up to like 150 going mm. into football. Mm. Um, but then by the end of basketball, and I also ran track, I was like a middle long distance runner in track. Um, by the end of track, I was usually down to about 135 again. So I, I, I graduated high school at about 135. So I've wow. I've put on about 60 pounds yeah. in, in 10 years of yeah. just training and stuff. Um and so I started playing receiver whenever I was in high school, um, which seems like well, how, that doesn't make any sense. But like I said, I was undersized to play running back, yeah. not skilled enough to play only, quarterback. It was kind of yeah, like my only, only option. option yeah. um, and I also played defensive back. And that was probably my my biggest specialty D-back, in, in football. Yeah, I would say there's a an NFL... Uh, linebacker that yeah. went in the first round, I think. Yeah, and the Griffin, yeah, um, yeah. Sha- Shaquem Griffin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there yeah, you yeah. go. He's yep. got just a hand. He, his arm goes down to like his wrist. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it goes down to like his wrist. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so just again, catching footballs and, and kind of figured out I, I'm lucky, like maybe it's through uh, actual physical adaptation or just luck. The one hand that I do have is, is pretty big. Like it's actually a little bit unproportional to my body, uh, yeah. anthropometrics. Um, so, so you that can like definitely help. Like I can, I can catch a football just with one hand pretty yeah. good compared to most people. And then I was able to just kind of learn body positioning yeah. and, and things like that to yeah. be able to catch also use my other arm. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I played a pretty significant role on, the football team and the basketball team and the track team starting like as a sophomore, I was a varsity player started both on offense and defense as a sophomore in football, um, and had significant minutes in basketball as a sophomore. Um, what about and, getting tackled, like coming down? Like we, you'd ideally try to stop yourself with two hands. Now, well, you norm- um, normally face you plan? get in face planted anyway, if you're a receiver, yeah, cause you're holding on to the ball. I, I will oh, say true, like, true. I, I very, like, I think naturally or like subconsciously, anytime I was falling or something like that, I would always land on my right side. Mm. So like my right hip, like in basketball, I was always like laying out for, for balls and stuff yeah. like that. And I would always just naturally turn myself mm. to my right side. So my right hip all season long during basketball yeah. was always like bloody and mm. scratched up and stuff and bruised and <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. Um, but what, what, in, in football, when I would come down on this arm, it's pretty painful. There's like a nerve or something that's kind of right here at the end where if I land on it wrong, it shoots like a nerve pain up through my arm that mm. I, I, can, I cannot compare it to anything that I've ever felt. But you catch in my a barbell right on it. Yeah. And my, my arm has grown some meat and some mass around it I was over, actually, throughout training. Yeah. And it's, I, I think it's just calloused, it's, right? It's like calloused. It's literally yeah, like I have a, calluses where I hold onto the strap and I have calluses on the top part where the barbell lands. Yeah. Um, and, and I've become proficient at it enough that it doesn't ever really feel like the bar is slamming mm. onto my arm. It, it is it's almost like timing. simultaneously yeah. kind of being caught there. So it doesn't really feel like there's it's a moment where the bar is floating and then landing on it or anything yeah. like I'm that. I'm guessing yeah. if you did that, you'd probably miss. Yeah. It's and, almost like you can... You can let a barbell crash on your front rack a little right, bit, yeah. But optimal timing would be not crashing. Exactly. You, it's like necessity is the mother of invention. You don't have the option if yeah. you let it crash, you're probably going to miss the lift. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I don't know that for sure. Yeah, but and, I'm just guessing. And, yeah, and that's that has happened and and does happen from time to time yeah. if my timing gets off yeah. or whatever. Yeah. How do you miss snatches? Behind to forward? Um, I've done. I've missed both. Yeah. I actually miss them forward more than anything. Is the strap still on your? On, yeah. Well, it's on the bar, so it's not. Is it still hooked? Yes. By the time so you, by the time I go overhead, the strap is still connected, so I can like I can like touch and go 
Got it. Snatches. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the bar stays. And again, go follow you on Instagram and you'll see yeah, all these things. Yeah, yeah. Coach Casey Acre is my Instagram handle. Yeah, Got Coach it. Casey Acre, yeah. Um, a- spell the last, a- A-C-R-E-E? A-C-R-E-E, yep. Cool. yep. Yeah, and Casey is C-A-S-E-Y. Yeah, cool. yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, just time and and building up that proficiency. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit yesterday. You asked me, like, how long did it take before I was comfortable loading it? It, it took, I, I think I said like around six months yeah. of just working with an empty bar and just some light loading and, and gradually and were working you up gung to ho where I during proficient. that six months or was it kind of like a, ah, oh, I should stop. Oh no, I was all in. Nice. Uh, this guy, any, man? Anything, <laughs> well, I figured, I figured, but six yeah, months, any, man. Yeah. Anything that I, yeah, I think it's almost like an obsession where anything yeah. that I feel like I have a chance of figuring out. I'll just keep, I'll just keep working at it until I, until I figure it out. There's really only two CrossFit movements that I haven't really gotten there yet. And it's ring muscle ups. I was actually thinking about that. Um, because just that transition with the ring moving around, there's just like really nothing for me to catch myself on. And I've, do you do I've, ring dips? I do ring dips. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, and I set the rings exactly the same height and I put my arm on top of the left ring rather than in the bottom loop. I put my arm on top of it. So the oh. straps, so my arm's like inside of the straps oh. right here. Yeah. And, and it's about the same oh. height on each side oh. that, okay. that I can do. Yeah, like but you that. couldn't Give do us that one more. Oh. Yeah. Oh. It'd, be, it'd be hard to do to figure out how to get from like a hanging position. <laughs> yeah, because you got to get that over, over the, the top and yeah. land it there. I can do them on the barbell yeah. because the, the barbell stays still or the, the pull-up bar stays still. Yeah. Um, and then handstand walking. I, which I work on from time to time and I stack plates up like I did with the wall walks and yep. try to get the balance. I just haven't really figured the balance did, did out it, much. I don't know much about this. Do they have a prosthetic that you could use? Like, yeah, a lot of, yeah, they, they do. do. And I, I, there's a guy that I, that I follow. I can't remember his name, um, at the Ricky. moment, but, um, <laughs> I, I don't, Not I can't him. remember. <laughs> um, and he has a prosthetic that, um, basically just at the end of it has like a ball that kind of swivels and he does handstand walks on it. Um, I've never really like taken the st- steps to go do that because um, really to have that prosthetic on and then try to do anything else yeah. would You'd be- You'd have to be like taking it yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Since I've been yeah. able to figure most things out right. without it. That Have you ever used a prosthetic in general? I did when I was younger. Um, was it when, just for- aesthetics or did you know like it was functional? Used, yeah. It, yeah. It, so the, and the technology has gotten so much better since I was a kid. I've seen some of them. Um, that, I, you know, maybe if I was a kid now, I may have stuck with it a little bit more permanently, but whenever I was growing up, it was very bulky and it had a, a harness that came all the way around onto my opposite arm. And it, it really only had like a claw yeah. where I would move my arm forward. It would close it and back, it would open it. So it had like a a spring lever thing on it. Um, and it was just uncomfortable. It was hot. The strap was itchy on this arm. And, and I had, I just spent so much of my time without it on that. I started figuring things out without it. So then whenever I put it on, it was actually a little bit of a hindrance. So I think I was like five years, years old and I had outgrown the one that the, the, the prosthetic that I had. And my mom was like, Hey, are we going to go get a new one? And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the process of CrossFit went, so you, we just got to the end of high school. Yeah. When did you, fun, did you can play? I, can I pause before you go there real quick? Yeah. I, I had one thing going before we move into CrossFit was mm-hmm. when was the first CrossFit. year that you, where are you going? Oh, taking the hoodie off. Yeah. Uh, what was the first year that you finally met somebody who also had your same condition? Well, or, I, or that just didn't have the same ability. Um, so whenever I was a kid, I was maybe like four or five. I went to a camp that was in St. Louis. So in St. Louis near, near where I live, um, there's a, the Shriners hospital. So they kind of like specialize in, in things like this. And there was a camp there for kids that were upper arm amputees. So we were all the same. What was it like? It was, it was people like you. It was kind of cool. Like I, I kind of felt like, Hey, these are, these are my people. Um, yeah, it was cool. Like we did, we did activities and projects of like learning how to use our prosthetics and and things like that. Um, yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, How old did you say you were? I was like five. I think it was, I think it was December before my, before I started kindergarten. So yeah, pretty, pretty young. Um, and then really after that, it was, it was many, many years. And, and actually whenever I was in high school, 
um, the new, local news station like did a story on me. So there was some, some video out there of me and I had some people from some nearby communities who had kids that were, that the arms were amputated or whatever. And they would come, a couple uh, families came to some of my basketball games. So I got to meet some kids and kind of talk with them a little bit. Um, but it really wasn't until I was like in college and I started kind of getting involved with, with CrossFit. So that kind of transitioned into your question, I suppose yeah. that, um, so I, I got introduced to CrossFit whenever I was in high school, just a little bit. Um, the athletic trainer for my school, um, coached at a CrossFit gym part-time. And so we, we did like some CrossFit football, like John Wellborn, yeah. um, CrossFit football stuff in our weight room for our football conditioning. Um, so I got a little bit of, of exposure to it then. What year um, was this? 10 years ago about, right? Yeah. 2010. Yeah. I was, I graduated high school in 2011. So somewhere between like 2009, 2011, I was doing, I touched on it a little bit. You but had like heard of it, heard of it and of kind of, of seen a little yeah. bit of it. And, um, yeah. Uh, then whenever I was in, in college, I studied kinesiology and, and was planning on, I, I actually wanted to go be like a college strength and conditioning coach. Um, and then just during that time, I, I kind of did some of my some of the kind of classic workout stuff, some bodybuilding. And uh, that allowed for me to start using some straps and some modifications and, and things like that to, to do some movements and start gaining some, some strength in this left arm. Cause when I was in high school, um, like in the weight room, I would just do like all single arm stuff. Yeah. And it, it definitely started causing some imbalances, some strength imbalances. And, um, you know, I had some back problems and I think it was all rooted in yeah. kind of the, the lopsidedness that I had developed from being an athlete. Um, so then just a couple years into college, me and my buddy just kind of started doing some CrossFit workouts just for kind of something different. We were looking to do some conditioning and did I, you find, I, well, when you say like you were finding main site workouts, main, or, yeah, main yeah. site, like okay. yeah. it's actually kind of funny. Like whenever I look back, like knowing what I know now, I think there was a stretch where, uh, like every week I would do, um, filthy 50 and Fran <laughs> just like try to PR every single week. Cause I just like, but those you were also two, can the, uh, back then, yeah, back then. Can. Yeah, I did yeah, like exactly. by four minutes yeah. on filthy 50, like every week. Um, yeah. Until you get to a certain level and then you're like, no, I can't yeah, do exactly. Anymore. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, we just kind of started teaching it to ourselves. Um, and that forced me to, again, I think it was just the competitive mindset of like, I want to be able to deadlift. So I figured a strap out yeah. that I could situate it on a bar, hold on to it with my arm and, and do deadlifts. And then that, what are, you, what are you some, like, what's your deadlift PR? Deadlift PR is like four Oh five. Okay. Um, is it limited by your ability to hang on? Maybe like, a little bit, but not really. I okay. just have a weak ass posterior chain, I think. Huh. Cause I, I can, I can back squat like four twenty five, four thirty. 430. Yeah. I've cleaned three twenty five. I've snatched four or uh, four. I've snatched, <laughs> I've snatched two forty five. Yeah. Um, so I've like some decent yeah. strength like numbers. Like a squatter more than a yes, puller. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Like my, my femur length and tibia length yeah. kind of, yeah, it works out for squatting a little bit better. And like I said, it was, it was something that I did for in, in high school. I could back squat like yeah. of the compound lifts that we were doing, like training for football, That's I could always could back do squat. Same, so yeah. I just, yeah, yeah. So I would just so, spend a lot of time squatting when yeah, I was younger. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so what were the skills as you were getting into it that were like the, the, that came the most naturally and that were required the most like skill adaptation or in ingenuity to figure out how do I get this done? Um, I mean, I think like just everything has almost just been like a progression on top of each other. So like I figured the deadlift thing out and I was like, okay, this is great. And I spent a lot of time like working on strengthening my deadlift and getting used to holding on to the strap and everything. Um, and then that progressed into being able to do power cleans. Cause I realized if I, pull hard enough and I explode my hips that then I can turn that bar over and, and my arm can reach through and I can catch the bar up on my shoulders. Does so, that, do you hang on to, Oh yeah. I've seen you, the strap yeah, does so stay the strap on because you did stay touch on. and go power clean. Yeah. When I first started doing it, the strap, I, I hadn't got that timing down to yeah. where I could hold onto the strap. Um, so it was always singles, you know, yeah. just one rep at a time. Um, and so then, you know, power cleans progressed into figuring out that I could clean and then I could situate my arm and then do like an overhead. Yeah. And then that developed into, I realized if I could shorten the strap up a little bit and widen my grip out a little bit, I could turn that into a snatch. And mm -hmm. so that those movements, the barbell movements kind of progressed on top of Naturally, each other. Yeah. As I got proficient at one, it was kind of like the foundation to then build on to like the next more complex thing. Um, and then for like pull-up bar movements, that those were probably the most challenging for sure. Um, 
so it, it again just started with realizing like I could put that strap on the on the pull up bar. Um, At and, first, were you like strong enough to just hang? Yeah, I was yeah. strong enough to hang, but not much more than that. Like, like you it, couldn't it do a pull de- up. Yeah, or anything, it definitely yeah. took a long time of just developing some pulling strength and doing like lat yeah. pull downs and rows and yeah. stuff like that to develop some of the scapular stability. Yeah. Like this, for a long time, this left shoulder was like hypermobile. Like mm. I could, I could pull it out of socket and in and out and stuff like that. So yeah. it just wasn't very strong in, in hanging movements. Yeah. And a um, single arm pull up is like one of the most advanced right. gymnastics yeah. and, skills. Not that you're only pulling with one. On, yeah, like kind yeah. of. Yeah, and for a, a for a while it kind yeah. of was, and yeah. uh, but then I realized that if I continued allowing for my left arm to be limited, that it was going to actually in the long term probably hinder me a little bit. So I forced myself to recreate that pattern and build some of the strength around my left shoulder complex to where I was pulling a little bit more evenly, yeah. um, so that it wasn't stressing my right shoulder out too much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that started with just getting chin over bar pull-ups and then I started figuring out like butterfly patterns and how I could kind of situate myself to, to do those. Um, it was, it was the open in 2016. It was the first time that I ever did the open. And my only goal was to do all the workouts RX. Um, and so the first workout of that was the overhead lunge, burpee, and chest to bar yeah. workout. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I had never done chest to bar pull-ups before because I was just never strong enough to, to do that, to get all the way yeah. up. So I ended up figuring it out and, and just did singles basically the whole time in, in that workout. Um, and then that, just knowing that I had that potential in me, led me to just work on them and work on them until I could like, you know, cycle butterfly chest to bar pull-ups. Yeah. Um, and then how many was, can you do now? Five I've, years later, I've done, I, I did a, uh, a workout a couple months ago that was, uh, 33, 27, 21, 15, nine, uh, chest bar pull-up and, and calorie ski. And I was able to do all those sets unbroken. Jeez, man. Um, so I, I don't know, I could probably do 40 or 45, um, unbroken butterfly chest bar pull-ups. Yeah. Uh, I'm, my brain is all over the place. Cause this is like, uh, he watched you train with the guys on site yesterday. And I was like, man, his fitness, if it were not like, if there were not skills of requiring both arms, yeah, it seems like as an, like if, if I write a workout that was 400 meter run box, jump over and biker, something that like, doesn't require a second hand to be as proficient in. Yeah. Are you beating or competitive with games athletes in those? Um, in, in, in some, in some movements. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm competitive. Um, yeah. And like you said, with like running is, is one that I'm pretty strong in because I was a middle long distance runner growing yeah. up. Um, yeah. Like jumping movement, box jump overs and box jumps and stuff like that. I'm, I'm like, what I would yeah. consider to be close to elite level yeah. on, on that double unders. Um, are they the same speed, like number of reps per minute? Um, I feel like they're a little be... bit slower. Okay. They're a little bit slower. And it's, it's one that I actually get grip limited on yeah, with that it's single. A lot of motion. It's, yeah. it's very much like yeah. grip and bicep limitation yeah. on that. This um, is easier. It like, with yeah, gravity it's, than it's, this. it's a little less muscle endurance yeah. limitation on, on a, yeah. on a normal jump rope. Toes to bar is a, a move toes to bar and GHDs and pistols and things like that. I'm, pretty close to on par with a lot of the, a lot of the games level athletes. Um, I I would definitely say I'm, I'm an aerobic responder. So high power output there, the elite guys are going to be able to beat me on, on things like that. Short two minutes. If it's short, I'm just, yeah, I just don't have that. Uh, it's something that I work on all the time of like cyclical power output and, and fast paced high intensity intervals and, and things like that. Um, like the, the, quarterfinals workout that with the snatch and burpee. G, no, the, the GHD sit up, uh, rope climb. rope climb pistol, something like that. I was, I was 134th in North America on that workout. Cause I can do big high volume GHDs. I can do big high volume pistols and it wasn't enough rope climbs that that was really a huge limitation for yeah. me. So, um, you know, certain things I I'm fairly competitive with the, the field. Um, can you do legless rope climbs? I cannot. Okay. No, I it, saw you clamping while you were up there, it looked yeah. like you had a, like a clamp with your hand and your arm. Yeah, and I was so, wondering, I wasn't, I was like laying down getting therapy. So I <laughs> yeah, didn't like yeah. see super close. I, I've tried to do almost just like a 
kip uh, like a pull up kip, kip and, and, and then catch <laughs> and sketchy. it's just not yeah it's very <laughs> sketchy yeah so I, when i do rope climbs i just basically grip the rope with my right hand and then just kind of anchor my Make left arm yeah. on top of my hand so that i can pull a little bit with my left arm um and then i just rely on being able to jump really high and be really good at toes to bar where i can pull my feet up really high on the rope and, and clamp stand and stand back up yeah. so i can do i can do 15 foot rope climbs in like two poles yeah um and, it, and that was definitely one that took, took a, a while. Long, took a while to gain that grip strength. Yeah. I was just and just confidence it, it was, in your brain exactly. being that yeah. high and your yeah. strength and it, all. It of was it, yeah. it was a totally different strength limitation on my right arm than what I had ever done doing everything like pronated. Yeah, going here, I was just weak. I just couldn't support myself for very long. So I spent a lot of time doing like the Spanish wrap with my legs, which is just like slower. Yeah, but it's a little less you it's know tighter grip endurance. Yeah. yeah, um, and then over time, I've just kind of developed the the J hook um, rope climb pattern to be a little bit faster and smoother on those. So. Man, I feel like five years is a really short period of time to develop the level of skill that you've gotten, even at taking the, like the ingenuity out of it. Mm -hmm. I think that your development from 2016, if that was your first open to now is just like, I mean, that's just impressive physical adaptation. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I had, I, I probably had two years of training, of just training oh, okay. so prior it's really been to like that. Almost it's seven been about years. seven, yeah. Okay. It's been about seven years that I've been doing I'm not impressed anymore. CrossFit. <laughs> 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 but I, again, I think it goes back to just like developing one thing, becoming extremely proficient at it, and then using the the principles and patterns that I've gained from that to then progress to progress up. So then like that that same open 2016, the the third workout was the AMRAP of 75 pound power snatches yep. and bar muscle ups. Yeah. Um, and so I figured out that I could do a bar muscle up by swinging my arm over the top of the bar. I would catch it in my armpit, which I think at the time wasn't even within the standards, but I went ahead and submitted <laughs> yeah, yeah. a score cause it wasn't very good. Yeah. Uh, and then like shimmy my arm up on top of the bar and then press it out. And then that kind of developed into being able to fluidly catch my arm on the bar and press up. And mm -hmm. then that developed into being able to hold onto the strap, catch myself, press up, and then cycle back into the next rep. So yeah, I think it's almost been like a continual development of yes, each thing. How absolutely. much of your training is just like figuring it out skill work? Cause um, I'd imagine like you would need like hours of just like sitting around and mess, even just messing with your setup, getting the yeah. strap length, right? Yeah. Like you, how much of that was your training versus like hard CrossFit? At at this point, not very much anymore. At this point, I've I've been able to shift and just really focus on the the training. capacity yeah. and the training and the the you know improving my meta, my metabolics and my mechanics and everything. Whereas, yeah, I mean, I would say four or five years ago, I was spending just sessions working on pull up bar movements or yeah. just sessions working on getting comfortable catching that, that snatch overhead and then getting kind of strong in those positions. Um, yeah. So, so at this point it's, I'm pretty much just training and I've, yeah. I've, uh, with what I need to be able to do, I have all those tools in the toolbox. And yep. now, now to me, it's just about like optimizing Making my them capacity, better, sharpening yeah. them, Make, getting yep, stronger, yep. learning how to make, yeah. Learning how to make dynamic contractions aerobic essentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So what's a, what was the total volume over the past, like early stages? And now were you doing like four hours a day, six hours a day, um, one session a day? I, I, have fluctuated quite a bit just depending on my life and what things I have going on through, through college. I was pretty m most of the time in college, I was one session a day. I had some times where I was, I, w I started doing two sessions a day. That would be one session would be kind of like a strength focused session. Another session would be maybe like skill and aerobic stuff. Yeah. Um, and now at this point I'm, I'm, pretty much year round, two sessions a day. Um, and those sessions are anywhere from an hour to two hours. So I'm, I'm probably training three to four hours a day, five or six days a week, pretty much year round at this point. So as an athlete that you might not have an answer to this question, because when people ask me, I don't always know for sure, but like, mm -hmm. why do you commit so much to it? Is you have a clear athletic end goal and is the clear athletic end goal you have now the same reason why you invested so much five years ago? Because the um, sport wasn't really the same back right, then. Right, yeah. Um, so now 
I, I just value the pursuit of maximal physical potential so much that whether or not the sport existed, I, I think I would still do it, be trying to do it. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of had that same mindset back when I was in college and I started like, I started following like what's rich doing and the, the CrossFit mayhem stuff and, and just trying to figure it all out. And I didn't know at the time if there was ever going to be a sport or an Avenue for me to pursue it competitively. Yeah. But I always said like, I don't really care. I'll just do it. Cause I enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, at this point I, my, my goals are to be the fittest one arm man alive and you got to um, be pretty compete. damn close right now. Yeah, I, I would say in in our world, I'm I'm in that conversation for yeah. sure. I've I've won I've won Wadapalooza four years in a row. Um, I've won several other adaptive uh, competitions that essentially are they're international competitions. You've won Wadapalooza four years in a row. Yeah, That's so that means you've sat through that long ass <laughs> ceremony four <laughs> years in a row. Yeah. Oh God bless you, sir. Yeah, I that know. is the worst thing in all of CrossFit. And, and <laughs> let me just tell you. Uh, the adaptives, we really got to sit through some shit because <laughs> we're always kind of like the last one. The to, la yeah. ju we're just always kind of like the, we're the, we're the forgotten yeah. children almost. Well, of, isn't, it, of the competitions. isn't it the elites who are the last ones? Well, just, just in, by, in, t in terms of like, um, workout briefings and, um, meeting times and oh, okay. yeah. we're, the we're always the, yeah. all, the, the, our stage setups are always taking, takes so long. So like, I can remember a few years ago at Wadapalooza, um, we had like, br like workout briefing check-in was at 1130 and my heat was supposed to start at one. I did not start my workout until after three o'clock. Oh, so I was, and, and they didn't let us leave the athlete corral. Like I was starving. We, I, I had no food with me and they had a lot just, of those logistical yeah, things. I know, and it happens, yeah, it, but, it happens. It happens across all the divisions yeah. and, you know, putting on a, an, a competition like that is daunting in the, the organization yeah. side of things. But, um, yeah, I think just in the last couple of years, the adaptive, community and the, the sport and our, our competition has, has, uh, a little more value has been put into it and better, uh, you just, just in the last couple of years, we got our own volunteer group yeah. that like, they stay with us. They know what needs to be on the floor. The judges know the standards in years past. It was like shotgun start. The, the, the judges don't even know like what's the standard for yeah. a wheelchair barbell power snatch, yeah. you know, and they're like figuring it out on the fly. So it's, it's, it's definitely, professionalized. it's professional. Yeah. Yes. It's becoming so much more professional. And, um, you know, I've been, a, have I've been there from some of the ground floor of that and, and been a part of that development and stuck with it despite some of the, um, you know, some of the limitations of, of adaptives yeah. being involved in some of these bigger competitions. Yeah. So at this point now I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of seeing the, um, the light at the end of the tunnel of like it really becoming accepted as like a legitimate sport. Yeah. Now it's in the CrossFit games. We're going to start, we're going to now have, um, adaptives at the games for the first time ever. So I'm, I'm kind of just like along for the ride and I want to kind of continue being a part of that and helping to legitimize the sport. So, um, you this, know, whenever, whenever I'm not having fun with it and I don't feel like I'm, I'm being a value to the sport itself anymore, that's probably when I'll, I'll give it up. Yeah. This is one of the only sports I feel that has a, it, as it gets created, like, you know, now they have it, I, they didn't before, but a professional infrastructure yeah. that you could continue pe competing in. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. what is, what are the alternatives outside of this Paralympics? Paralympics. That's really yeah. it. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's individual sports that are very niche and yeah. like wheelchair wheelchair has a lot of different options yeah, as far as just participating in wheelchair basketball and wheelchair, wheelchair rugby and, and things like that. But it's not, it's not professional. It's more of like kind of club yeah. or, um, a little bit smaller, not, not necessarily really international in a lot of those. Yeah. There are some sports. sports you could probably play at a professional level. Like I, I was trying to think of it as we're talking bowling. I know there was a pitcher in the MLB. Yeah. Nolan, was it? Not uh, Nolan. No, Ryan. but he, uh, it was a white Sox. Yeah. Some, I think. somebody, yeah. I can't um, remember his name, but yeah. Yeah. Um, he did what now? He, he was a pitcher. He was a pitcher with one had arm. one arm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So he, and he, he would like throw, he'd hold the glove underneath his, his, his arm was like exactly like mine. He'd hold the glove here. He would throw it. And like, basically in the throwing motion, he would put his glove on so that he was like ready for it, which that's, that's the same thing I did in the, 
short amount of time that I played baseball. What again. made you quit baseball? Boring. I it was boring. Too slow. Hey, was I, too I, slow. I was just fishing for that. Too comment. slow. Yeah. My, I'm still that surprised was one every day that that sport is not canceled. That was a Everyone's sport always that like, my brother played I that baseball. I never really had interest in. Why do you love baseball? I don't know. Just going to a game, eating I just, a hot dog, grabbing a beer. I'm like, that is not the fucking just sport. Standing. Yeah. Just a lot. Too <laughs> much. Eating standing. a hot dog and drinking a beer. You play a whole game. You play nine innings and you might have like, you know, eight hits or something. Yeah. It's just. That's yeah. another one you got to have a lot of patience for. Sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't disrespect baseball players and the, the ones that are good at it it's a very it's it's a high skill sport but a little too slow for me basketball yeah, yeah. football and track were fast were fast paced yeah. and there's always something going on and and yeah those were the ones that definitely interested me the most so that was we just went like i know yeah we're like all over the well, place how did go? yeah uh, I kind of sucked. Uh, bunt. You just stick. Yeah, out just and bunt, bunt and be fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could hit, I could make contact with it, but never. I, I actually did. Um, my, all of my best friends growing up played baseball. Like they loved baseball, and so I'd go to their games and stuff. And one time they had Oof, a couple kids on their their little league team that were they were going to be like on vacation. So they didn't have enough. They didn't think they were going to have enough players. For they didn't think they were going to have nine. So they asked me to come and, and fill in and play on the team. Um, and when I got there, they ended up having nine. So I was the 10th. So I was like hanging out in the dugout for most of the deal, just being there available as a sub if needed. Um, and I got in, in like the last inning. Uh, so my lifetime career, I, that was the only game that I actual organized game I ever played in. I got a hit, stole second, stole third and got home on a bad pitch. So I <laughs> nice. like a, a yeah. thousand percent batting average <laughs> nice. on base percentage, steal percentage nice. and that whole deal. So and after that, I was like, I can't play anymore because yeah. my yeah. stats are <laughs> You sound like my hockey career. I was, I played two seconds, got one goal and that was the end of wow. the day. <laughs> yeah. I think that's actually more impressive Literally than Literally two mine. seconds. <laughs> the play started. <laughs> Got the goal. Nice. The, yeah. <laughs> so that's we, the original question, I feel like, or the last question I asked was about your why about competing. Yeah. What about beyond that? Like from a cultural standpoint, influencing standpoint, you're a coach, you have your own coaching brand. Mm -hmm. Like, do you have aspirations? Uh, is it more just about the pursuit of athletics? Cause it's something that you love as a passion or is it a pursuit of, helping adaptive athletes overcome whatever situation they got? Is it a combination of all that? Like yeah. what, what's your, I, I think it's, it? I think it's both. Um, I, I, like I've said, I, I have a deep internal drive to compete. Um, I love training. And so to me, like if I'm going to be training so hard, there might as well be something that's kind of at the end to, to shoot for. Yeah. Um, but to me, I'm, I'm as much competing against myself as I am anybody else. And I love to use myself as a test subject for my programs and, mm -hmm. and for my, um, my training principles. And, um, yeah, but then there's also this, this idea of wanting to be an influence and, and, and give other adaptive and disabled people a visual of what is possible. And, and I do value that. Um, but I still, I, I definitely think that my own personal pursuits are what, you know, what keep me involved in it the most for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just love to train and, and compete. And to me, I'm, I'm healthy and I can, I can do it now and I have time for it. And, um, I don't know, it's just movement is just another part of my day. So, um, as optimally as I can express myself physically, uh, I'm going to keep doing, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have like, I, I need to go, publicize myself too much or anything yeah. like that, but it's kind of part um, of the process. Yeah. Of doing I, I think so. Yeah. Better. I think yeah. so. And I mean, I have, I have a wife and a son. And so I, I love the idea of getting to be, um, a great example for him and, and show him what is, what is you're, you're capable of if you work hard and if you are patient and if you, um, uh, are okay with challenging yourself and taking on adversity. So I, I always keep that in the back of my mind that I've, I've got a little boy you know, your looking son? at me, he, he'll be two next week. Um, so I, I have, you know, a, a kind of a bigger reason also for, for some of the things that I do as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, I had another question, but I'm forgetting it. Do you have any other questions? I think you there? were going to ask him. Oh, now I'm forgetting it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did. Now I do know what I asked. Um, I, this is a question I don't know if you can fully answer, but growing up on a, on teams, on a bunch of teams and being in your own, I guess, as a coach, you're kind of influencing and leading your culture in whatever you're building. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you almost have more authority 
to stop people from complaining and whining about whatever situation they have, or just being a, a role model of work ethic because of your situation. I was talking about that with somebody earlier. I'm like, I feel like he would influence a culture. Well, just being a part of it because whether or not you're outwardly like, don't make excuses, your, your way of being has not made excuses for whatever your situation is. You just figure it out yeah. and have done that. Yeah. I think it's more kind of that latter deal. I've, I've, I've always been a natural leader and, um, growing up, like on my high school teams, I was the team captain on all of them, but it was, it was, I think definitely more of the, the example rather than the, the verbalization, uh, verbalization yeah. of, of leadership. And to me, uh, a leader is someone who's willing to do whatever it takes for the group to be successful, not the one that's willing to tell everyone what they need to be doing. Mm. Um, and so I think that it's almost more kind of what you said of just like being and, and just doing the things that I do can have a, a positive impact on, on the people around me pretty naturally. Um, I've, I've never been the kind of like, um, you know, rah, rah type of guy. Um, but I, I think that I, I, I do in, in many cases have, have kind of that effect on people where they are, they'll just kind of like see what I'm doing and be like, okay, I, I have no excuse. I, yeah. I look at what he's doing why am I letting myself use that? I'm a little bit tired today yeah. as a reason to not train or something like that. Yeah. So, and, and I've never been the type to verbally say you know, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think again, just kind of being who I am and, and operating in, in a certain fashion kind of has that natural effect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it had that effect on me, to be honest, just yeah. uh, not in terms of me making excuses for myself or my body, but just thinking about, how much have I really dedicated to the pursuit of mastery? I mean, mm -hmm. I feel pretty confident that I like do everything that I can for TTT. Yeah. But that means as I do that, I do a little bit less for myself mm -hmm. and my own athletics and all yeah. that. I still take training seriously because I love it and I believe in it. But as I watch how you conduct yourself and how you figured your skills out and how much more technically sound you are because you've had to be, whereas I could rely on just kind of being an ogre, like, you know, mm -hmm. like a flexible and athletic growing up and figuring out those skills. And it made me like second guess myself and think about how could I be better as a result of it? So, yeah, I yeah. mean, you had definitely some of an influence on me. I'm assuming it would happen subconsciously for yeah. people. Yeah. People definitely have to shift their perspective a little bit when yeah. they see me and, and other people in the adaptive community. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't see myself as like a unicorn or anything like that. Cause there are, there are other people just like me or even ha people that have even greater limitations that are doing yeah. amazing things and have had to overcome uh, maybe even a greater yeah. amount of adversity than I, yeah. than I have. So, um, but you still yeah. stand out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, yeah, that certainly, um, forces people to, to, kind of change their perspective on some things, which if, if it helps them to, um, better themselves by 1%, then, then great. I, I feel, I feel confident. I feel, um, you know, honored to be able to have that, that effect on people. Cool. I have one more question. Okay. It's a more of a lighthearted question. Okay. <laughs> Kids, I yeah. feel like are oftentimes so honest because they haven't been conditioned by culture yeah. in, uh, what's appropriate to say and ask and what isn't. Do you ever have that situation where a kid will be like, mom? Yeah, you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. What's the, what's your reaction to that? It's like laugh, play. Do you oh, respond to them? Fight them, to them? Smile. <laughs> yeah, beat them up. Smile. <laughs> yep. Smile. And, uh, you know, explain to them, you know, a lot, a lot of times kids will say, what, what happened to your arm? And I'm like, <laughs> I, it's how I was born. Yeah. I've, I've never had my hand. And, um, some parents, I, I, so this is maybe going to be a message. Like, let your kids ask those questions. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be like, no, shh, don't yeah, do yeah. I don't have a hand. I, I know it. It's not a mystery. It's not, uh, I'm aware of we it. We should so. clip that out. And make it as, as so, it's okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. be fine. And yeah. I think it's, yeah, don't, don't condition your kids to think that it's like taboo or yeah. something like that. Let's let's take, at least that's my perspective. Let's just take it. that clip. Like you snatch PR. I don't have a hand. <laughs> you clean PR. I don't have a hand. Yeah. So like I'm, I will tell parents, you know, I, I encourage questions because yeah. if I were a kid and I saw someone with, with no, someone was missing a hand, I would probably be curious too. So yeah. it's an opportunity to um, teach the parent and the kids some perspective and, and 
Yeah. Most other adaptive athletes that I know, they feel the same way. They're, they're comfortable and aware of who they are. And so having a kid ask that question is not something that they're uncomfortable with. So yeah. What, yeah. what about adults? Sometimes I, I honestly, I'm curious. Yeah. Like if somebody's in a wheelchair, I'm like, what happened? Did, yeah. did, were you born that way? What is, what is it? And you like, ain't got no legs. <laughs> yeah. I feel like in today's culture, it's almost like you said, it's become taboo to yeah. just be honest. And sometimes I have these really honest thoughts and I feel like, Oh, mm -hmm. it could be a way for me to learn somebody's story, yeah. connect, ask them questions. Yeah. But I don't do it mm -hmm. specifically because I don't want to be offensive. Yeah. But yeah. what is your take on that? Is oh, it you, something you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for everyone yeah. that has a disability, but to me, and my mindset is, is exactly that it, it's an opportunity to learn. Yeah. It's an opportunity to share a story and potentially have a, the, that perspective changing opportunity for, for someone. So, um, but yeah. that's also asking a lot for everyone to want to just have a conversation with yeah. a stranger yeah. all the and, time. And, like, and fuck I mean, you, I'm trying, trying to yeah, and, get on with my day. Yeah. yeah and, and like, yeah, I mean, I, I totally get that too. I was um, talking about like, even at CrossFit competitions, like just yeah. curi curious yeah. of I, how it operates to me, to me, I think that if you have those questions, then, then ask. And, um, if, to, if, if someone that's disabled has an insecurity about that, then in my mind, mind frame, that's their problem. Yeah. And, and it's time to own it and be okay with it and understand that you are different and, um, try to take those as opportunities. Don't look at them as, um, you know, something that's negative, use it to, to share a story or to educate somebody or to make somebody feel more comfortable about asking those questions. Because if, if you take it negatively and you like, let's say you go ask somebody that's in a wheelchair and they're like, you know, yeah, fuck, fuck you. off, yeah. you know, then that's going to totally every other person that you encounter, you're going to second guess should I asking yeah, those yeah. questions, whereas yeah. maybe it's me and, and I would totally welcome that. So, yeah. um, you know, if there are disabled people out there that are uncomfortable with your situation, I think my, my advice would be, um, start, start you, they, they need some perspective change as well. You know, see it as an opportunity to share your story and to educate people and to, um, you know, maybe start feeling a little bit better and more comfortable about yourself. That's good advice, man. Yeah. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. To anybody that's listening, I guess, if you're an adaptive athlete, we're thinking about potentially collaborating together. So we'd like yeah. to hear about what you're looking for, what you do for training, maybe in the comments, anything you want to share, like plug your stuff where they, we already know we can find you at, is it coach Casey Acree? Yep. Yep. Coach at Casey, Coach Acree, Casey Acree, yep, on, on Instagram or, um, summit systems is my, is my gym and summit, remote, summit systems. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's our, our Instagram page. So yeah. All right, my man. Well, thank you very thank much you for so the much. conversation. Yeah. It's been great. Appreciate it. Yeah.